Welcome to a solo war game review from theplayersaid.com. I'm Grant. Today, uh, and, and I hope you uh, excuse me, I'm using a different rig today um, rather than our standard tripod that sits on the floor. This is a new unit that actually sits on the table, can get much more close to the action. I can even move it around to different parts of the board. I'm I'm trying to try it out so that I can get a better, I guess, uh, operation so I can do more playthroughs. So anyway, today, as you can see from the board, and here's the, uh, the box cover, I'm going to do a very quick review and a summary of the gameplay for a very cool solitaire game from White Dog Games called Gorbachev, The Fall of Communism. Uh, once again, it is a solitaire uh, war game. It is a, actually a part designed by Ben Madison. And you can see here, it's a part of the Cold War Trilogy. I, uh, I believe that Thatcher's... Um, I, I can't remember what the other two games are. I'm, I apologize. I should have looked that up. But you can check that out. I don't think all of them are out yet. Um... But this is White Dog Games. This is one of their print-on-demand uh, games from Blue Panther. Uh, great little games, frankly. I, I have uh, probably a dozen of these and really have enjoyed playing them. I feel like they're good quality, very well-designed, very fast-playing, and, and generally very interactive and interesting. There's only been maybe one or two that I thought were pretty basic. Um but this is an example uh, of a game that I really enjoyed from them. I'm going to go ahead and move the cover uh, over. But real quick, back to Ben Madison. Ben Madison has designed probably a dozen different war games starting, I think, as early as 2009. He, uh, some of them are two-player. I think four or five of them are two-player. A majority of his games are so of the solo uh, variety. I have played... I think six, this will be my sixth game by him. Here was my first one called Mound Builders. Uh, this was actually done also with Wes Ernie. But these are States of Siege series games, uh, the ones that I have and have played. And this Gorbachev game is, is the same. It's a States of Siege series game uh, without being a States of series, a Siege series game, if that makes any sense. It follows the same general concept, meaning you've got a central point that you're trying to defend here. You're trying to defend against a coup attempt uh, against Mikhail Gorbachev during uh, the period, uh, the late mid to late 80s and early 90s, when communism uh, really fell uh, from, from what we knew. Um, this game goes from 1985 through 1991 and follows a lot of those major events. Those events come up in the form of cards. But once again, you're trying to defend against being uh, having being ousted, having a coup uh, carried out against Mikhail Gorbachev. So you represent one of his aides. Sorry, I knocked these over. You represent one of his aides that are helping him uh, deal with socioeconomic, military crises, uh, disasters, catastrophes, etc., and trying to guide you uh, through this concept, keeping the people happy, uh, overcoming a lot of the difficulties, and remaining in power so that the Soviet Union uh, can, can continue. But once again, central point, and then you can see there are five different tracks. Uh, here's the Russia track. Here is the uh, Communist Party CPSU track. You've got a Central Asia track, the lime green. Uh, here is a Caucasus track, the blue. And the yellow is a Baltics track. So these are all peoples of the, Soviet, the former Soviet Union during this period. Different groups, different views, different ethnicities, trying to fight against communism and gain... Uh, their their independence, uh, in essence. If you remember the terms perestroika, glasnost, you can see those terms written uh, in the different boxes. Those are ideals, free speech, freedom of choice, 
etc. And those those themes are governed in this game by you as the player trying to keep everyone happy so that you don't uh, get kicked out. You'll notice that there are different boxes that then connect to this Moscow coup. Some are longer than others. Um, the Central Asia, no, they're all five. They're not longer. They just feel longer. I don't know why that is, but it looks like they're all five boxes a piece. And these people markers, when different events activate them, they're going to move one space closer and you have to deal with them. You have to push them back stop them, prevent them from getting in. You'll notice these X's uh, are positioned in the boxes that are immediately adjacent to Moscow. These will call, uh, they are called factionalism. If there are units at the end of a turn after you've done your efforts sitting in that box, what it's gonna cause is Gorbachev to lose support in the Politburo and uh, the different politicians represented here on the right side will begin moving up into this opposition. What's going to happen is you're, if these ever enter this center area because they were forced to be moved by a card or something else, you're going to have what's called a coup attempt. You're going to have to roll 2d6 and you're going to have to roll greater than uh, or equal to the number of politicians in this box. So at the beginning of the game, you got one, two, maybe three politicians in that box. You're going to roll 2d6. Oh my gosh, I just rolled a double one, which is hilarious. I actually lost a game the other day uh, like that. But you're going to roll 2d6 and just hope to be above that amount, and you're going to remain in power. You won't lose. You'll continue fighting, uh, and you can, you can survive. There are, once again, the game is driven by cards. Here is a look at the cards, and there are four different groups of cards. So you can see they're, they're color-based. This is gray, this is the very end of the game. Green is the third period of the game. The yellow, or gold, I think they refer to in the book, is the second period of the game. And then the red uh, uh, or the, are the at-start cards. The, the way you can tell that, and it's pretty interesting because when they designed this game, they designed it in uh, with regard to anyone that is colorblind uh, can then see the symbols on the on the turn track so you can see their symbols here's a sun in the first two boxes 1985 1986 that corresponds to these cards you can see the sun in the upper right hand corner so you don't need to worry about cards you know uh, that those cards are good there are eight cards in the first phase and then you're going to jump to the second, you can see it has a uh, it has a star. There you can see the star in the upper uh, corner, upper right hand right hand side of the title bar represents that second area. The fourth is kind of a black dot. There's only four cards in 1989, as we know. 1989, the wall fell, and really it was it was over. Um, but the game then continues into 1990 and 1991. And those are signified by a cross, and there are cards associated with those years. So these, this deck is seated. It is seated based on the colors. Um, you're going to shuffle these up. So I'm, I'm never going to have the same, you know, in the first, the first area, I'm never going to have the same cards because I'm going to shuffle those up. But the cards tell you everything that needs to happen during the turn. And actually, one other thing I wanted to show you, and I'm going to take these, I'm going to get this. They, they give you this very interesting, they call it a counter tray. Um, but what it is, it's a player aid card that assists in the sequence of play. You can see there it is written on the bottom. But then it lays out all the different types of counters that you're going to have, gives you the numbers so that you understand where they are when you have to uh, act on those. So that's kind of a neat feature. I'll move those back over. Uh, most of Ben Madison's games, Jeff Davis has that, Don't Tread on Me has that, Nubia has that, The Mission has that, uh, and now Gorbachev has that. I think it's a real great player aid to help you play the game and keep things straight. But back to the cards. So each turn, it's going to start with draw a card. If you can see the sequence of play, which you can't now, it's off screen. Number one, draw a new card. So you're going to draw a card off the top of the deck. Remember, there's 27 cards. This one is the Danilov Crisis. 
Once again, that symbol and the color red denotes that it is a 1985-1986 event or card. There are some symbols. You're going to read from left to right, top to bottom, and you're going to do everything that this card tells you to do. Most of these are symbols that you are going to simply follow, and you'll become very comfortable with them. Uh, but it makes the game very easy, makes it somewhat procedural uh, and easy to follow, which I think is a good thing. Because to me, any game should be creating an environment, a good game, creating an environment where the player has to make tough choices. Whether it's what actions to take, what resources to, to use, where I can give a little to get a little, etc. And this game has all of that. So you just follow this process and you do each card as they're listed. So this time symbol um, relates to the season. So here you've got four different seasons, winter, spring, summer, and autumn. Each year has four of those seasons. So this is going to tell you, move that time marker. All you do is you move it over from winter to spring. There we're starting. The next one is a G with a six-sided die on it. That is for Gorbachev. So Gorbachev is obviously the leader. And each turn, you're going to roll a die. Each turn that he is in the Politburo Bureau uh, in support, you're going to roll a die. And on any roll, zero through four, you're going, he's going to stay in support. And you're going to gain two free uh, what are called efforts. Efforts are simply rolling a die to push somebody back, rolling a die to increase a state asset that we haven't talked about yet, uh, or doing doing those types of things. The game is about obtaining new efforts each round, using those efficiently, and trying to stave off your enemies, period. So when Gorbachev, when you roll that die, uh, you're going to decide, do I get those two or do I not? They are very important. There are a lot of rounds where you don't have any efforts that are identified by the card. So I'll show you this. You'll notice this F, this is the effort symbol. It's like a squiggly lightning bolt with an arrow. When it says no efforts, you're getting no efforts. But you'll notice it says plus G2, which means the Gorbachev two efforts if you've rolled and successfully achieved those. Now, one special thing any of those two free efforts from Gorbachev, one of them can be used immediately each round to push the Communist Party counter back automatically without the need for a roll. So if I want to use one of those efforts, I just push it back. Gorbachev had more control over the Communist Party. He didn't have as much control over the people and what they thought. So you're going to have to uh, understand that, and you're going to have to keep that in mind. I did notice there's one thing about this game that I kind of don't like. There are a lot of those exception type things where, oh, you can do this or you can do that, but only when this happens or only when this is in place or only when this marker is there. And man, it gets, it gets kind of confusing from time to time. I feel like this game, you need to take your time, really read through it, follow the sequence of play. I think the rule book is very well laid out to help you in that, and you're going to have to be on top of that, or you're going to have the occasional misstep, which is okay. I don't care. I'm playing it solo. No one's here judging me. The Solitaire States of Siege series of games, judges aren't here to punish me. I'm playing a game for fun. So all that, we're not even, not even through this card yet. The next is typically you'll have some type of an event. There are disasters. There are massacres, uh, and there are demonstrations. Those three things will come up next in this. A disaster simply refers to a number of chits that are put into a draw cup. Let me pull a couple of those out. So you're going to draw, when it says disaster, you're going to draw one of these disaster tokens, or chits, and you're going to do what it says. Now, you're only going to get one of these typically. Sometimes it does say draw two. Um, but you're going to then find those in the rule book, and then you're going to have some negative result from those. Admiral Nakim Nakimov uh, talks about a submarine that was in trouble, and you're going to have to, or it's going to incite the Russia people track, and they're going to move one step closer uh, to Moscow. The Armenian earthquake, that's another example there. That's actually one of the few that is good for you. It's going to cause the Caucasus marker 
to move back away from Moscow. So that is tied specifically to an earthquake that happened. I believe it was in 1987. Uh, an earthquake that happened really distracted the media, the people, etc. And they didn't, they weren't as concerned about communism and Gorbachev and the party. They were concerned about staying alive and eating. So you, you kind of have some of that pressure relieved, and they're going to move away, um, move away from uh, from you. In the massacre area, fairly interesting. These are really different. They're fairly simple. But the same thing, when it says massacre, you're going to draw one of these and you're going to simply do what it says. So this also gives some reference to a, a, a historical figure, an event, some kind of a cult or something that did a, did a massacre. And you'll notice there are uh, areas identified that one of those tracks, Central Asia and the Caucasus, and they have a down arrow. Anytime you see a down arrow... That means that one of those tracks is going to advance closer uh, to Moscow. So that's what those mean. Demonstrations are pretty interesting. You're going to roll 2d6. Um, I always use a different colored die for the first die because that identifies the number of these tracks. These are called paths. I'm sorry, I'm getting those confused. So I'm going to roll 2d6. I rolled a 31, so that was my roll. So that means the, the three uh, path. And a one means I'm going to count out one box from Moscow. So that's where this is going to happen. It's going to happen in this sedition space. If this is controlled by me, meaning the Central Asia marker isn't there, if the Central Asia marker was there, I'm going to put a positive modifier called a demonstration. Those are good demonstrations. Those are demonstrations that you can fight against. They're going to aid you in, uh, in rolling against uh, those tracks. But a negative crowd, one that's out to get you a little bit more, they're going to, they're going to do a negative modifier to your, to your rolls. So that's what that is. That's what a demonstration does. Kind of a neat aspect. Uh, I think they do a good job. Ben did a good job of kind of tying that in to the demonstrations and the movement uh, of people standing up for themselves, et cetera, fighting against the government. Um, so those are the three type of special events. Then you're going to see anywhere from one to five of these down arrows next to uh, either a, uh, a path on the board, you know, Russia, CPSU, Central Asia, Caucasus, or Baltics. Or down here, you have these state assets. These state assets are the five-year plan, media and culture, and military might. They are kind of your overarching ideals that keep you in power, your army, the control of the media and the culture, and then your plan to do what you need to do and how well that's going. And you can see there are numbers on those, and there's a marker. And then there's a bonus side here on the six, where if you ever are able to effort this by rolling a four or higher, you move the five-year plan in there and you're going to gain a benefit. I'll talk about those benefits here in a moment. Um, but this is a very important part of the game. This is more important. It will immediately end the game for you if they get into Moscow. But these also will immediately end the game if they get into the zero uh, section here. They're going to cause a coup as well. Once again, you're going to see these down arrows. You're going to simply move that. This one says media and culture and military might. So I'm going to move the, the sorry, media and culture down one and the military might down one. That's what those mean. So that, that can be a real, a real hassle. Then you're going to come to the number of efforts. Remember I talked about that earlier. This one says zero. There'll be anywhere from one to five efforts here. And then you're going to add the Gorbachev bonus. So you'll have anywhere from say, two to seven uh, efforts each round. You're not going to have seven very often, so don't get excited. More often than not, you're going to have one to three. And then the X is the end of round phase or turn in phase where you have to do certain uh, aspects. You have to check for uh, any of these state asset bonuses that I talked about, and I'll talk about that right now. So once again, we're talking about turn in, but I'm going to talk about these state asset bonuses if the five-year plan ends the round in that six bonus spot, 
you're going to get one of these plus one modifiers that you can put anywhere out on this path to aid you in rolls against that marker. So I might put it on uh, Russia. Then when I use an effort to try to move Russia, I'm plus one. And in this game, you have to roll equal to or greater than the number identified on the people's marker. So here I have to roll greater than or equal to three at plus one. I'm gonna be able to do that fairly easily. I rolled a six, so I would be able to push him, him back. So that's the power of the five year plan. The media and culture, if it ever makes it into the bonus section, you're gonna get what's, what's called a Vremya marker. And this is a reference to an old Soviet TV program, but you're gonna be able to put those on any of those paths as well. So let's say I'm gonna put it here on the Central Asia path. When I roll a die, and let's say I just missed, so I have to roll a three or higher to move that Central Asia token back. If I roll a two, I can then discard this, get it off that board, put it back into the stash to increase that roll by exactly one or decrease it by one. There are some instances where you want to roll low, uh, particularly when you have these Pravda uh, markers that are out on the track. They're going to have to roll lower than uh, the, the number in the brackets in order to move up. So I've seen a people's marker you know, that would have been activated and moved into Pravda, I've seen them roll less than that three, four times in a row, and all of a sudden they don't get to advance. So that can be a huge benefit. I like the Vramya one quite a bit. The bottom, tied with the military might, are these MVD security units. They're very good, but they're very hard to get. You'll notice you have to roll a five or higher, as you do with Vramya. And those are just hard to, you have to use an effort to do this roll, and you're going to miss more often than not. But when you get these MVD security units, you get to put those out in, on a path in one space. Now let's put it here in Caucasus. And you can actually, if you have two or three of them, you can stack them and they're gonna offer you the same benefit. If a marker is activated and would have moved into that spot, you can discard an MVD security unit to make that uh, marker not advance and stay in the box that it was. So that can be very powerful. I will try very hard at the beginning of the game to get at least one, if not two of those out. Those don't get removed. They're going to stay there the entire game. Uh, and you can use those to great effect to help yourself. Um, but that end of turn round, if you've earned one of these bonus assets, you're going to put that out deployed at that time. Remember the factionalism, the X's. Uh, if there's a unit that ends the turn in one of these X areas or on the state assets, if one of these state assets, let's use five-year plan, ends here on these X uh, squares, you're going to have the erosion of your support from the Politburo. So for each one of these, I'm going to move one guy into opposition, a politician, so in this instance, if I had Caucasus there on that spot and the five-year plan there, I would pick two of these guys and move them up. And all of a sudden you can see some opposition is building to Gorbachev uh, and his actions uh, during this period. So you got to be careful of that. You got to watch that. You got to fight like heck to make sure that that doesn't happen to you. In the autumn turn, let's move this autumn down of 1988, the president is going to be, a presidential election is going to happen. Currently Reagan, Reagan here is the United States president, as we know. In 1988, Michael Dukakis uh, ran against George H.W. Bush um, in a presidential election. Bush ultimately won, history says that Bush won, um, but Dukakis can get elected here, I'll show you these two markers and I'll explain the difference. You're going to roll a D6 on a six, Dukakis wins. So you're going to put Dukakis as the president and replace Ronnie. Um, if Bush wins, you're going to put H.W. Bush down and he's going to be the president. You will notice that there are numbers on them. There's a two on Reagan. There's a one on Bush. And then there is a, that's a negative. That's a zero on Dukakis. Those numbers relate 
to whether the Soviet Union is disarming their military and removing them. So for instance, you can see here in this Afghanistan box, when an event happens that moves that over to the red light and covers it up, the Soviet Union can choose at any time during their round to go ahead and call those troops home. So this is the 40th Army stationed in Afghanistan. You'll notice it has a three in the middle of the NATO infantry symbol. That three is a number of free efforts that you can earn this turn in a one-time bonus by calling them home. Now, when you call them home, there is a negative effect to that. The world and your people get upset about that. You're going to reduce the military might on this state asset track by the number that is printed in the upper left-hand corner of the president uh, counters. Reagan, you would reduce that by two, so that's big. You don't want to do that typically when Ronald Reagan is in the White House. H.W. Bush, when he gets in, you can reduce that, and it only reduces it by one. You can do it there, and you want to do it there more than you want to do uh, with Reagan. If Dukakis wins, man, there is no effect. That military might never moves down. Dukakis is soft on, uh, or supposedly soft on the Soviets, and it doesn't matter uh, if they go ahead uh, and and de-arm or disarm, sorry. But that's what those uh, that's what the presidential election is, and that's a part of that end turn sequence. And then after that turn is over, what you're going to do is you're going to draw the next card. So you simply draw the next card off the top, and you follow this process again. So you'll notice the season's going to change with the F. You're going to roll for Gorbachev. Uh, let me let me show you what happens if Gorbachev, if you fail. So if you roll a five or a six, all right, I rolled a five here. So if you roll a five in this roll and you're going to roll 1d6, Gorbachev goes on vacation. And what happens is Gorby mania happens and everybody gets distracted and they're following him in the newspaper and on the TV. And all of these demonstration markers that are on the board uh, can be removed. You don't typically want to do that, uh, but it, it's something you, you can't necessarily avoid. Now, if you had several negative markers out, that'd be a great thing. You know, you're like, oh, great. Finally, I can actually use my efforts to affect those people. Um, but that's what happens when Gorbachev uh, goes basically on, on vacation. And then what's going to happen at the beginning of the next round, he's automatically going to come back to the Politburo and support, get back, roll his sleeves up, get back to work, and you're going to gain those two free activations without having to roll. You only roll when he starts in that support box, uh, but that's an important part of the game, keeping him involved, keeping him uh, uh, going. So back to this card. Then you, then you can see that it skips the disasters or the massacres or the demonstrations, goes directly to affecting the Baltics track and the five-year plan state asset track, Baltic Pass, sorry. And you can see this one gives you one effort plus the two that you would earn from Gorbachev, and we did. He's in the support box. And then once you've used all those support or those efforts, you then go to the end turn phase. So remember, there's 27 of these cards. You're going to have to survive through all 27 of them without having anything move into the coup box or have anything here move into these zero spaces where coups will happen and, and survive those coups. So if you survive that, at the end of the game, you're going to win. And then you go to a level of victory based on some victory points. You'll notice there are numbers in these spaces. This is the CPSU track. If it's up high here and the marker's there, you're going to get 12 points. Here it's 10. Here it's 8, 6, 4, etc. Some of these others are low value. So what you're going to do is you're going to try to keep those at bay. But getting near the end of the game, you really want to make sure Russia and the CPSU and Central Asia track are as far to the right away from Moscow as possible there's actually a, a total of 36 possible points if all three of these boxes are in the end space. That's a lot. Then you're going to go down one of those 
level of victory tracks. Um, 61 or higher is, is a major victory, the Order of Lenin. The Cold War is over. Uh, 54 to 60 is Order of the October Revolution. Gorbachev remains the president of a strong USSR. 47 to 53 is Hero of the Soviet Union. The Union Treaty holds despite secessions. The U new Union of Soviet Socialist Republics holds most of the USSR. 46 or fewer is a victory, but the Ronald Re it's called the Ronald Reagan Freedom Award, and technically you won, but Gorbachev resigns in disgrace. So it's one of those level of victory type games. Um, and frankly, it's really hard. I have played this game now six times. I have won once. Sometimes I've lost on like turn five. It just depends. Uh, that, uh, maybe six or seven. It's hard to lose on five turns. Um, but sometimes you just lose because you can't, you're using your efforts and you're trying to get people to move back and they won't. You fail. Um, but, you know, it's hard. Like I said, I've won once out of six games. It's a challenge. A lot of these solo games, that's what I want. I don't want a cakewalk. I want a game that's going to be fast, fast playing, easy to learn, but it's challenging and difficult. One of the things I really like about this game, and I already referenced it in your efforts, your number of efforts... Let's talk really quickly how efforts can be used. Efforts really only have two purposes. To push one of these tracks back, you simply burn one of your efforts. I track my efforts on a six-sider. Uh, I'll take a six-sider. If I had six efforts, I'll turn it here. When I use one, I go down to five so that I, I remember. I have a bad memory, so sometimes um, I forget. You're going to use one of those efforts. You're going to try to roll, once again, equal to or greater than the number printed on the people counter on that path. So in this instance of a four, I'm trying to roll a four, five, or a six. You will notice there's a plus one. That stands for any time you are attacking one of these adjacent boxes that are adjacent to the Moscow coup box, you get that plus one modifier. It's very important to remember, I forget it a lot. So really with that plus one D DRM, I only have to roll a three, four, five, or six. So I'm gonna succeed basically two out of three times. So I'm gonna go ahead and roll the die. Okay, I rolled a three plus one for this modifier equals four, he gets pushed back or they get pushed back. So that's how you're going to use an effort. That's one of the ways. The other way, let me move this board over just a little bit. And I already referred to this, the state asset tracks. I'm going to focus on media and culture. The next level that you're going to here is a five, and it requires a four or higher to uh, achieve that. So you use an effort just like you would pushing uh, the people back. You're going to roll a die. I rolled a three. I fail. That effort is uh, is wasted. Now, there is no limit. If I have five efforts, I can do this one all five times, succeed or fail. So I'm going to try it again. I'm going to burn an effort. Hey, I rolled a five. It's going to move up and I succeed. You're going to have to keep these. I try to keep them at least three or higher. Early in the game, when they start at the five position, I'm going to bum rush them and try to get some of those bonuses so I can get stuff out, particularly the Vremia and the MVD security markers for the media and culture and military might. Those are very, very powerful. The plus one modifiers are nice, but early in the game, frankly, the people are all far back and it's not really that important. So using uh, those, those efforts, those scarce efforts smartly is important, but one thing I haven't covered yet is there are different assets that you have. You have a Warsaw Pact box. These are your allies. You have the uh, German Re Democratic Republic here on the left. You can see that this is a Berlin Wall marker. When the Berlin Wall marker is up, you can't do anything uh, to take troops away to get new efforts. But once, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute, the other assets that you can borrow 
are these KGB uh, assets. There are three of them in the KGB box. The difficulty with using those KGB tokens, here, let me show you what they look like. You see that's, uh, see who's pictured there. Um, but the KGB box, you can use those. Every time you use those, you're going to cause one of these politicians to defect. They're upset that you're using the Communist uh, Party's assets, the KGB, in that way. They're going to, uh, to defect. The other way is the president's. As I mentioned, you can bring the troops home in Afghanistan. So those different assets you've got to use when is the best time. And some of them cannot be used until certain things happen. I referenced the Berlin Wall. That's uh, actually one of these um, disasters, the Berlin Wall falling. So that can fall very early or it can fall very late. Once that has fallen, you can send these troops home and get these number of efforts. You can also disarm your nuclear nuclear weapons, <clears throat> and you're going to roll on a chart. Basically, anything four, five, or six, you're going to get one, two, or three uh, new efforts. But that's going to cause some politicians to defect. They're upset that you're <coughs> that you are disarming. The Warsaw Pact is interesting. As long as Brezhnev, and here's the counter for Brezhnev. As long as he is in this doctrine box, you cannot do anything to your, uh, you got to keep an iron grip on your allies here. Basically, Poland, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, the DDR, and Romania, those Eastern Bloc countries. Um, but when Frank Sinatra comes on the scene, here you can see this Frank Sinatra counter, and that comes from a specific event card. He's then going to distract, once again, distract the Communist Party, I think. That's kind of the, what, what they're trying to say. Then you can use these allies. Let me pull up two of them. You can use these allies to then get additional efforts. So let's go through these and what these mean. Very top is the country name, Bulgaria on the left, Poland on the right. The star signifies that they are an, they are an ally of the Warsaw Pact. Then you can notice that uh, effort symbol to the right is a three and a four on the Poland. There's a die symbol, a one for Poland and a two for Bulgaria. And then there are down arrows and two items. For Bulgaria, if you, if you use this and discard it, it's called throwing your allies to the wolves. You're going to reduce the media and the CPSU track. They're going to move. Uh, Poland is the five-year plan and the CPSU. Once those are discarded or used, you're going to discard those off the board. And then there, there are some cool, they're not in the cup to start. There are three of these disaster random revolution tokens, 1989 plus, you put those in the cup. When that is pulled, what you're going to do, you're going to roll a six-sider. I rolled a three you're going to look at the numbers on all the allies that you have remaining in the Warsaw Pact box. So Czechoslovakia is the one that was rolled. You can see it has a three. You're going to lose this token and its efforts, so you don't get them, but you're going to have to move Russia and the five-year plan because they revolted against you and left your, uh, your alliance, the Warsaw Pact alliance. Um, so that's neat. You got to know when to use those. You got to know when to hold them and when to fold them. You don't get any points for those at the end of the game. Some of these designs from Ben Madison, you've wanted to hold on to things like that because they give you assets or victory points at the end of the game. In this, they do not use them as much as you can uh, and when you can because they are, they are very vital. Uh, the DDR, we already talked about. Uh, once that wall is down, you can send the troops home demobilize and you get a certain amount of free efforts. Um, the KGB, same thing. You're going to get one free effort that you have to use immediately and uh, you discard that, then you're going to affect uh, your support level there in the Politburo. So once again, really like that aspect of managing your scarce resources. You get some, uh, only some resources and you need way, way more. Uh, think about that as Supply, supply chain issues during the 80s and 90s in Russia where they couldn't get food and other goods on their shelves. Uh, people wanted more and they just couldn't get more. So they had to do with what they had. 
We're actually realizing that in the United States now. I've been to Walmart and seen more things on the shelves that are out than I've ever seen in my entire life, except when there's a snowstorm coming, right? Um, but yeah, managing those, identifying which of the, the, the worst, uh, you know, which of these paths are in the greatest danger and then trying to work against those. One of the thing I would point out, all uh, four out of the five of these paths have a better marker. I'll show them here. So you can see there are certain events that will say, replace the Baltics, which is currently a three. Let me just show you. A very weak three, something that you can beat, you can beat that very easily. An event will say, replace the three with the five. You're gonna replace that and put the five out. Now all of a sudden you're rolling against a five, that becomes very difficult. Caucasus has a goes from a four to a five, CPSU from a four to a five, and Russia from a three to a four. Um, Central Asia never changes, but you do have a cool asset called um, Uzbek Mafia. These can come out at a certain time based on an event and the location of that Central Asia marker. You put them here at the beginning. Um, you can push them out and what they ultimately ultimately do is, is help you uh, attack the Central Asia people because you're gonna roll, this gives you the ability to roll 2d6. Oh, I rolled a five and a six, so I didn't even need it. But you get to roll 2d6 and you get to keep the one that uh, that you want. Um, so that's kind of a neat asset. I really wish something like that was on the Caucasus or Russia uh, or the Baltics because those are the tracks that are really difficult. Um, but that's another neat thing that's involved. There's some other uh, minor parts uh, that are pretty cool. Um, but overall, the game, I think, is a very good look at this period of time. I think the rules are laid out very well. In fact, if, if you could see my rule book, maybe you can. I flipped through this thing four, 14 times during a game, even though I played five or six times. But it's really well laid out. They've got, this is the important text. These are things that you need to know. Red stuff is kind of highlighted to make sure you're aware of that. They give examples here. This, this is a little bit of an example of the principle that they're trying to teach you. Um, and then the other thing here in the pink, these are kind of designer notes that are sprinkled throughout the, the rule book. I, I think they're very cool. I like that Ben adds those in because I play these games a lot of times to understand and learn. And uh, I think he does a great job of that. I think the player aids are really good. Here's another. This is the event sheet. So this lists all these special events and the disaster events. It has on there the arms uh, control. Remember I talked about you can uh, disarm and you're going to roll a die. These are what you're rolling for to try to get extra efforts. And then on the back, there is an example of play that you can walk through very simply uh, and understand how to play the game. But those are the player aids. Love the cards. I love that I know generally what's in the deck, but I don't know what's coming up next because they're all shuffled. And I, once again, I learn uh, from the deck. I think it's very cool, very well done. I enjoy the uh, manipulation of the assets, the state assets box, trying to get those bonuses. I think there's a lot to like in this game. What I would say, um, I'm going to show you here. Let me, I'm just going to pick this up and move it over here. Here's kind of a look at my um, Ben Madison solo games. Let me move those back. You can see Mound Builders I already showed you. There's Jeff Davis. There's Don't Tread on Me, Nubia, The Mission. They all have similar elements, but each of them has their own unique aspect. My favorite, and I think they're, they're stacked there in my list of favorite, Jeff Davis. Mound Builders is on top. Jeff Davis is absolutely fantastic. It's the Confederates. You're, you're, you're playing Jefferson Davis and the CSA during the, the uh, Civil War. Don't tread on me. You're playing the British during the Revolutionary War. Nubia is a look at Egypt, uh, the Kingdom of Nubia, and its defense against all the elements that are coming in against it. And then the mission 
is a look at the early Christian church at the from the time of Christ, uh, basically to uh, the apostasy. Um, very cool look. There's a lot of cool things in those. Each of them have similar elements. Like I said, they all have tracks, generally, except for Don't Tread on Me. It does not have tracks. It's kind of a board. But they have some cool rules, historical elements uh, sprinkled in, and really make for a fun and engaging play experience that I've really enjoyed. Sorry, now I've got everything where I can't get it back to being squared up. But that's a look at some of those games. I've thought about doing a, a very quick summary of those five or six games in a video, and I think I probably will do that. But this is my review of uh, Gorbachev, The Fall of Communism. I want to thank uh, White Dog Games for provi providing this to me uh, as a review copy. I uh, appreciate that and uh, look forward to playing this one again trying to do better. Once again, I'm one in five. I'm getting there, but it's still very difficult. Um, but I also look forward to their other solo. They probably have 15 to 20 solitaire games. I've only played six or seven of them. So I look forward to trying out some of their other games. And I think if you haven't explored or don't know anything about White Dog Games, I think it's going to benefit you to uh, find out about them, get some of their games, uh, and go from there. So Thank you. Once again, I've been Grant from the Player's Aid. Thank you for watching.